Scarface, Big Al, Public Enemy Number One. These names terrified civilians, mobsters, police, and even the mayor. But his arrest record said Al Capone. It was obviously uh, uh, the epitome of uh, Capone's uh, philosophy was you get far better with a smile and a gun than with a smile alone. So that was his uh, motto, kill and then worry about the consequences. Capone and his brothers grew from small-time bootleggers to the bosses of the Chicago Outfit Gang. And with the help of political intrigue, money, and corrupt politicians, they ran all of Chicago. Al Capone realized that part of the secret to power was to control local governments, which he did by bribing officials. The ugly part to me of prohibition began when the politicians learned that they could line their pockets by only allowing certain beer trucks into their wards. But Capone's love of the spotlight and of money led to one of the bloodiest gang wars in Chicago's history, and ultimately to his downfall. Capone eventually also was fed up and orchestrated, allegedly, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and that was the end of the uneasy peace between the Chicago outfit on the South Side and the North Side gang. This is the story of the man who became one of the most recognizable names of the 20th century and became public enemy number one. This is Mafia, season three. Just outside of Chicago sits the suburb of Cicero, Illinois. Today, the small town is known for its large retail outlets and racetrack. But in the 1920s, the town was the base of operations for the Chicago Outfit, Illinois' very own Mafia. On April 1st, 1924, Cicero was celebrating the election of a new mayor, Joseph Kleina. Dozens of journalists and members of the public gathered around the steps of City Hall. As Kleina gave his acceptance speech, Behind him stood none other than Alphonse Capone. His presence at the event made it quite clear to everyone just who was really in charge. Lawrence Bergring is the author of Capone, The Man and the Era. Al Capone realized that part of the secret to power was to control local governments, which he did by bribing officials. Um, he controlled the, a local mayor, Joseph Klena, whom he considered his guy, who was uh, duty-bound to obey his orders. Capone and his brothers, Frank and Ralph, had helped rig the primaries, and then the mayoral election. The mobsters had spent the days leading up to the vote beating up officials, shooting up political headquarters, and even threatening citizen voters. But despite the victory, Capone wasn't happy. Kleina was given the position with the understanding that he would look the other way on the city's speakeasies. But in his acceptance speech, Kleina began to criticize the secret bars. And these very speakeasies were the foundation of Capone's criminal empire. And when he felt that he was being disrespectful, he wanted to make a public example of him. He literally kicked the mayor, uh, Al Klena, down the steps of City Hall to show publicly this is what happens to people, even politicians, perhaps especially politicians, who defy Al Capone. Thomas Repetto is the author of American Mafia. He rode down the steps of City Hall, a city policeman who was watching turned his back and walked away. Uh, you know, that, that's the kind of guy Al was. You don't hit the mayor over the head. You know, you, he's, you're your mayor, you're controlling him. And uh, he made his point. He didn't kill him. Um, he didn't uh, do something else to humiliate him. That was enough for Capone to show who was boss. And it made a huge impression on the populace. Capone had an entire city in his pocket and was putting on a show for the press. But what kind of man would so boldly kick the mayor and get away with it? Support for Mafia comes from Manscaped, who is number one in men's below-the-belt grooming. 
Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. That's why Manscaped has redesigned the electric trimmer. Their Lawnmower 2.0 has proprietary skin-safe technology, so this trimmer will nick or snag your nuts. Manscaping accidents are finally a thing of the past. And don't use the same trimmer on your face as you're using on your balls. That's just nasty. Manscaped also has the Crop Preserver, an anti-chafing deodorant and moisturizer. You already put deodorant on your armpits. Why are you not putting deodorant on the smelliest part of your body? Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code MAFIA at manscaped.com. Always use the right tools for the job. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code MAFIA at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. And use code MAFIA. Al Capone was born in Brooklyn, New York, on January 17, 1899. The young Capone grew up in a poor tenement near the Brooklyn Navy Yard. His father was a barber, barely keeping food on the table for Al and his eight siblings. Deidre Capone, Al's grandniece, recalled her family's immigrant background. My grandfather, Ralph James Capone, was Al Capone's older brother and his business partner. And Al Capone was the fourth child born to his mother and father, but he was the first child that was conceived and born in America. So on his shoulders rested all of the expectations that his mother and father had for leaving their family in Italy and coming to America. He was the American dream, and he wanted to be the best that he could be in the business that he was running, and I believe he did that. The Capones were a hard-working, law-abiding family. But at the time, Italian-Americans faced discrimination as immigrants. And this wasn't something Al would stand for, even as a child. The Italians in America were the low people on the totem pole. They were the last to be hired and the first to be fired. Uh, teachers would complain about the Italians in school. They called them smelly and dumb and greasy. So there was that zest inside of Al Capone to show the world that the Italians really had some worth and that they could accomplish great things. So he was fulfilling his mom and dad's dream. So Capone was looking for self-respect for people like him, and he gave them a sense of, if not uh, dignity, then at least people's awareness or even fear of people like him. At 14, Capone dropped out of school to work odd jobs. He was a candy store clerk, a bowling alley pin boy, whatever he could find. But it wasn't long before the world of crime came calling. In 1919, the U.S. government outlawed the sale of booze. This was known as the Volstead Act, or more widely, the Prohibition. Selling alcohol of any kind was now a crime, but that didn't mean that the American public was going to give it up. Street gangs quickly realized there was money to be made in the illegal sales of alcohol. Lana Guggenheim is an educator at the Museum of the American Gangster. Prohibition offered a new way to make more money. There was something that was in demand on the market. The market wasn't supplying enough of it. And if you could get your hands on it, you could charge the price you wanted. And surprising nobody, this became a major way to make some cash. And Capone was about to meet the man who would start him on his criminal career, Johnny Torrio. Al Capone got thrust into this business through somebody called uh, Johnny Torrio. Johnny Torrio owned a bunch of brothels. And the thing about the brothels is when the gentlemen would come in there, they were offered alcohol, they were offered beer. beer. 
And when Prohibition came in, in order to keep the brothels going, that opened up this whole business for Al Capone and Johnny Torrio to bring alcohol in mainly to service the brothels. Torrio convinced Capone to move to Chicago and help him turn alcohol into an underground business. They would get bootleg booze and illegally supply it to the people of Chicago. Nate Hendley is the author of the biography Al Capone. Prohibition, the attempt to ban the sale of alcohol in the uh, United States, was a complete failure in big cities like New York and Chicago. And in Chicago already had a reputation for having a corrupt government and a thriving underworld, even before Prohibition. Uh, Chicago became the quintessential prohibition city because of its location. It was close to Canada, just across Lake Michigan. That meant that booze could freely come into the city as an entry point. Also because the law enforcement infrastructure in Chicago was very thin and very hypocritical and very easy to bribe and buy. And that's what Capone and other people like him did. Chicago at the time was the perfect environment for a bootlegging business and the mayor was not interested in enforcing prohibition law. And in the 1920s, the main mayor in Chicago was Big Bill Thompson, who announced openly that he was against prohibition. His famous line was, I'm wetter than the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And at the time, a wet meant that you were in favor of alcohol, dry meant you were opposed. He had a wink-wink, nudge-nudge attitude towards gangsters. He was arguably in the pocket of gangsters. And so Chicago became really the epicenter of Prohibition era violence. And uh, you really had this sort of like almost slaughterhouse environment for a few years in Chicago. William Big Bill Thompson became an early ally of Capone's. He was the mayor when Capone first came to Chicago and took donations from the mobster during his 1928 re-election campaign. This amounted not only to cash donations, but like Clinton's election before, Capone's gang rigged the voting booths and threatened opponents. This was known as the violent pineapple primary. Even in 1920, the political landscape Thompson ran was corruption ridden, creating the ideal infrastructure for the criminal empire Torrio and Capone were forming. Capone senses that he's in the right place at the right time, that Chicago is the perfect environment for a gangster on the rise to make a lot of money very quickly through prohibition. And he's also smart enough to sort of branch into other sort of rackets, such as prostitution, uh, you know, protection racket, loan sharking, gambling, all the usual sort of, you know, black market activities. So he's sort of perfectly situated, uh, you know, to sort of make his mark in crime, as it were. Though both were smart and ambitious, Torrio and Capone took two very different approaches to running a crime syndicate. Torrio was in the camp that keeping your head low was the key to staying on top. Uh, like Capone, Torrio was a New Yorker. Unlike Capone, he was very adept at keeping himself out of the limelight. Uh, but he quickly identified Al Capone as a promising up-and-comer and, and protege, um, and gradually let Al Capone have more and more responsibility. Johnny Torrio was Al Capone's mentor, but he was completely different than Capone in most ways. That Johnny Torrio was very much sort of worked from the shadows, worked from the background, considered himself a gentleman, perfectly happy to use violence, but didn't commit violence himself, had his minions do it, and sort of kept his hands more or less clean. Johnny Torrio at heart is a businessman not a thug. That's the big difference between him and Capone. That Johnny Torrio wasn't obsessed with power and control. He just liked the money coming in. The money was good. The world of bootlegging was booming. And the outfit wasn't the only gang trying to make a profit. Their principal rival gang? The Northside Gang, led by Dean O'Banion. Thomas Repetto is the author of American Mafia. It was a multi-ethnic group of guys who had grown up as gangsters on the north side of Chicago, uh, and they were always poaching on Capone's territory or feuding with him. Torrio, ever the quiet businessman, wanted to avoid all-out war with the north side gang, but it couldn't be avoided. Torrio did try to broker a 
an uneasy peace with O'Banion and the North Side Gang, which only lasted for a short while. Torio was trying to kind of keep it under wraps to avoid gang warfare. But eventually, O'Banion cheated Torio out of $500,000, which if you think that's a lot of money now, consider it in 1920s dollars. Um, had to do with brewery acquisition. It cost Torio to be arrested. And Torio said, all right, I've had enough and ordered O'Banion killed. And that was the end of the uneasy peace between the Chicago outfit on the South Side and the North Side gang. Hey, who doesn't want less stress in their life? If high interest credit card bills are adding to your stress, I've got a solution for you. Pay off your credit card balances and save money with a credit card consolidation loan for my friends at Lightstream. Get a rate as low as 5.95% APR with AutoPay, much lower than the national average interest rate of over 20% APR. Oof. Plus, your rate is fixed, so as rates continue to rise, your low rate won't budge. The online application is quick and easy. You can apply right from your phone. And you can even get your money as soon as the day you apply. Lightstream believes that people with good credit deserve a better loan experience. And that's exactly what they deliver. Just for my listeners, apply now to get a special interest rate discount. The only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com forward slash mafia. L I G H T. S-T-R-E-A-M dot com forward slash mafia. Subject to credit approval. Rate includes 0.50% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com forward slash mafia for more information. January 24th, 1925. Johnny Torrio and his wife Anna were driving home to their apartment. They pulled to a stop outside the building. They had been out shopping, so their back seat was full of designer bags. Johnny put his hand on the door handle and glanced up through the passenger seat window. A Tommy gun stared straight back at him. Dozens of bullets hurtled through the windows, and glass shattered all around. A string of bullets hit Torrio's jaw, lungs, groin, legs, and abdomen. And from out of the shadows came the new bosses of the North Side Gang, Jaime Weiss and George Bugs Moran. Moran lifted a gun to Torrio's head. But Moran's gun misfired. He was out of bullets. Moran gave Torrio a kick in the stomach before running off, leaving him to bleed to death. But miraculously, both Torrio and his wife survived. Johnny Torrio is almost murdered in front of his own apartment uh, with his wife present, and he decides enough is enough. He says, you know, this is it. I don't want to have the threat of being murdered hanging over my head. I'm happy to turn everything over to Al Capone as long as I get a slice of the profits. That Johnny Torrio wasn't obsessed with power and control. He just liked the money coming in. So while Torrio is recovering from his gunshot wounds, when his near assassination, he turns everything over to Al Capone, you know, his former protege. And Capone, of course, is delighted by this and keeps his end of the bargain by sending money to Torrio, but basically behaves in a totally different manner uh, than Torrio did. Capone was now in control of one of the biggest bootlegging syndicates in America. And at just 26 years old, he was one of the youngest mob bosses in America, worth millions of dollars. Capone moved quickly to put his own stamp on the Chicago underworld. He was nothing like his mentor. Johnny Torrio had been very much sort of a guy in the shadows. You know, you work nine to five in your criminal job, then you go home for dinner with your wife, you spend the evening at home. You don't get in the newspaper, you don't hold press conferences, you don't, you know, flash your money around. And Capone pretty much ignored all of that advice. Now in charge, Capone was able to take more extreme steps Torrio wouldn't have, namely, taking out his enemies more overtly. 
Deidre Capone says her uncle was a family man, but could easily change on a dime when it came to business. Al Capone was a very complex character. Um, I saw him once in my life with two different personalities. The man that I knew for the most part was my uncle. He was jolly. He was fun. He loved to sing. He loved to cook. But there was one time in my relationship with him where people came to the door and they wanted to speak to him. And he put on a suit coat, went into the parlor, and I followed. And he sat down and became a completely different character. Uh, and somebody that quite, it, it, it startled me. It, it kind of scared me to see him as a different man. Um, after he had the talk with these gentlemen and they left, it took him, for a little girl, it was like an eternity, but he finally composed himself. He looked over at me and winked and then got up and we went back to what we were doing. So that was uh, quite an experience for a young girl to go through. Selwyn Rabb is the author of Five Families. It was obviously uh, uh, the epitome of uh, Capone's uh, philosophy was you get far better with a smile and a gun than with a smile alone. So that was his uh, motto, kill and then worry about the consequences. Capone also took liberties to get the law on his side. He took to bribing police, intimidating politicians, and threatening his rivals. He was. He was a, a, a huge personality. He had... He loved to be in the center. He would go into a nightclub, he would go into a restaurant, and he would have to sit, sit in the center of the room so that everybody would know that he was there. He wanted the spotlight to be shining on him. Capone loves his notoriety, that he loves being seen as the bad guy. And he really, he sort of plays this up that, you know, the way he looks, the way he dresses, the way he acts... He's almost like a Hollywood imitation of a gangster in many ways. Uh, and he, he loves it. He loves the limelight. He's perfectly happy to, you know, get his name in the paper. Capone soon outpaced his contemporaries, even rivaling the success of the bootleggers in New York, young gangsters like Meyer Lansky and Frank Costello, or like Lucky Luciano. Luciano was a rising lieutenant in one of the big New York gangs, he would later be known for making the Mafia. But at the time, he was Capone's New York counterpart in the bootlegging game. But Luciano also approached the illicit business in a very different way than Capone. The two great contemporaries in the late 20s and early 30s was Al Capone in Chicago and Charles Lucky Luciano in New York. Uh, Luciano did not look for the spotlight. He wasn't interested in attention. He knew secrecy was his best safeguard. While Capone's success was built on his notoriety, Luciano believed violence inevitably led to conflict and failure. Luciano was not opposed to violence. If killings had to be committed, they would be committed. In fact, he engineered several before he became top man of his own family in New York, before the five families were organized. What he understood was that violence was bad for business. What Capone did attracted the wrong kind of attention. Sooner or later, someone will be after you. You can't leave bodies strewn in the streets. Luciano and other rising bosses weren't interested in showing off. They wanted to keep their mob business strictly out of sight of the public. If Luciano had a uh, ultimate message for future godfathers was no wars, no flighting, no obvious bloodshed. Uh, and the only way you could run a modern American mob family was by keeping a low profile. Stay out of the limelight. Don't get involved in the, in the media. And uh, if anything, your best security is one word, secrecy. 
But Capone was never going to be an elusive mob boss, working in the shadows. He liked to flaunt his power and his wealth. The five-star Metropole Hotel in the center of Chicago became Capone's new headquarters. Here's Lawrence Burgreen again. Um, he took a suite of rooms there, uh, cost thousands of dollars a day. He installed a lot of gunmen. Uh, there was a gym, which he rarely used, but he wanted other people to use. Uh, there were women who came and went uh, to entertain the men. He thought anybody who didn't take advantage of the women, there was something suspect about them. Um, and if you wanted to do business with Al Capone, you f went to the Metropole, and that's where you found him. Um, Capone made himself a public figure. He wasn't lurking in the shadows. He was living in the Metropole. He was a very public figure figure. The Metropole became a kind of unofficial city hall in Chicago. Everybody knew where they could find him or somebody who knew him. He was accessible. That was very unusual for a gangster. Um, and he loved to see and be, be seen wherever he went. Um, and he wore very conspicuous clothes. His suits were kind of an electric blue or electric purple. Uh, they were made by very expensive tailors. So he was a peacock uh, and he loved to show off. Capone was publicly in league with the extremely corruptible politicians. When Chicago replaced Big Bill Thompson in 1923, he moved the outfit to Cicero, where they had Kleena in their pocket. He bribed local lawmakers so he was free to flaunt his position in public without fear of arrest. Uh, he holds press conferences in his house, which is, you know, announcing grandly that I'm quitting crime, which, you know, is a total lie. At the same time, should be mentioned, He's not a fool. He goes to baseball games and he brings a boy that everyone assumes is his son. It's actually a stand-in. That he's not stupid enough to bring his real flesh and blood to a public place like a baseball stadium where he could get assassinated. So, you know, he'll make a splash, but he does it a little cautiously. And he goes in public. He has a lot of bodyguards. He has an armor-plated limousine. So he's, he's a publicity hound, but he's not a fool. If there's one thing the Mafia got right, it's knowing the value of a good home-cooked meal. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality, no matter your skills with a knife. HelloFresh delivers fresh ingredients with step-by-step -step instructions to make a meal in 30 minutes. No grocery shopping, no measuring out ingredients, or wasting anything. No fuss. And they have something for everyone. You can choose between a vegetarian plan, calorie smart, or old-fashioned family recipes. They even have new fun series like Hall of Fame and Kraft Burgers. The more meat, the better. And I have to love their chicken sausage and spinach ravioli. A classic. And there was plenty of food for the whole family. Even your pickiest relative will be happy. And if you really have the whole family over, you can add sides and desserts like garlic bread or cookie dough. Garlic bread really makes a meal. And if you're out of town or out of town, you can skip days or even weeks or change your plan entirely, easily. For $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com forward slash Mafia 80 and enter code Mafia 80. It's like getting eight meals for free without having to owe any favors. That's HelloFresh.com forward slash Mafia 80 and enter code Mafia 80. Meanwhile, in New York, Luciano was trying to get the various mobs to work together. If they did, everyone could share the wealth and not attract unwanted police attention. Attacking your rivals in the streets brought double trouble. But in Chicago, it was becoming the standard. Capone didn't want to share the wealth, and neither did the Northside gang. And the bitter rivalry was about to become an all-out gang war. Um, in Chicago, uh, the, rival, the uh, rivalry for the income from booze and related activities, uh, which um, involved both Capone and Bugs Moran, uh, became more and more heated. The man who stood between Capone and being king of the Chicago underworld 
was George Bugs Moran, the mobster who now ran the Northside gang. Also the man who tried to kill Torrio. Moran and Capone pretty much always hated each other. Um, They're both Catholic, but Moran really detested how Capone was himself frequenting prostitutes and also how his gang on the South Side would use prostitution to make money. That's something that Moran's gang on the North Side of Chicago never did. He thought he had to eliminate the Bugs Moran gang so he could be, if you want to call it, the boss of bosses. No competition in Chicago. Capone's gang launched a series of violent attacks on Moran's network. It was carried out underground, away from the public and police's prying eyes. But the battles were equally as ferocious as a normal war. Any car could be booby-trapped. Anyone might betray you. The press, however, were excited. They called the conflict Chicago's Beer War. There were murders on either side. Uh, The murder rate in Chicago increased, and also the technology increased it. One of the weapons they were using had been borrowed from the First World War, and that was the machine gun, or Tommy gun, which was, of course, infinitely more dangerous than a rifle or a pistol. And uh, both sides had the machine guns, and that became a symbol of the beer wars in Chicago. And they were extremely dangerous, and a lot of people died as a result. Not Al Capone. Um, He never carried a weapon with him, or very rarely. However, he had gunmen who constantly accompanied him several steps behind who were armed, but he liked to give the sense that, well, he had nothing to be afraid of. He didn't need to carry a weapon with him. Um, Nevertheless, those Tommy guns were omnipresent around him. The Tommy gun, a World War I invention, was an automatic weapon that made the gang warfare all the more possible and more deadly. The iconic gun also became associated with Capone, a signature weapon of his gang. Capone was on the way to becoming America's first ever celebrity gangster. But this was in direct contrast to the fellow mobsters in New York. Colleagues or rivals like Lucky Luciano were appalled by this behavior because they felt Capone was just attracting attention to their illicit activities. And they felt, rightly so, that they would flourish if they were out of the limelight. And Capone kept attracting attention to everything he was doing, and by extension, they were doing. So they wish he would just stop and go away and let them continue uh, without benefit of all this attention. But, of course, he wouldn't. Worse than not going away, Capone was about to get a lot more headline attention. The war with Moran was about to spiral out of control. And so at that point, uh, you know, only one of them could possibly survive what was essentially a fight to the death. September 20th, 1926. Capone was eating lunch on the first floor of his favorite haunt, the Hawthorne Hotel. At 1.15 p.m., heavy machine gun fire echoed through the restaurant. Capone and his bodyguards hit the floor as the sound of bullets intensified. Pinned to the ground, Capone heard a car speed off into the distance. He stood up and ran to the door to get a good look at his assailants. But something was strange. Despite hearing hundreds of bullets, nothing was broken and no one was hurt. Then it dawned on him. It was a trap. The apparent drive-by was just a decoy. Capone's bodyguard tackled him to the ground, just as a second caravan of seven Lincolns sped past, hitting this time with a real round of gunfire. Remarkably, Capone was unharmed, though shaken. And now he had only one thing on his mind. Revenge. They tried and failed to take out Al Capone himself. Um, Capone was kind of spooked by that, and soon after he started having his armored car situation that became rather famous. Um, Capone's gang did eventually take out Jaime Weiss. That left Moran free to run the gang as his own, as headman, and he was there for quite some time. But because of this, the series of failed and somewhat successful attempts, depending on how you look at it, Capone eventually also was fed up and orchestrated, allegedly, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. February 14th, 1929. Bugs Moran received an anonymous tip-off that there was a load of Capone's bootlegged whiskey for purchase at a nearby warehouse. 
Moran told his crew they would do the deal at their secret garage on North Street in Chicago on Valentine's Day. Moran himself didn't go. The story that we tell at the museum is that Moran was late because it was Valentine's Day. He had a date later, and he was delayed having got himself a haircut so that he could look nice later on. What he didn't realize was that this was a trap set allegedly by Al Capone. The idea was to lure Moran to a warehouse on North Clark Street to kill him, take out some of his lieutenants as well, and basically cut off the head of the snake kneecap the gang and just knock them out of the picture. It is assumed, um, this is generally understood, that the Northsiders were lured by uh, the promise of stolen booze for sale that was supplied by Detroit's Purple Gang. The Purple Gang was a group of terribly violent, mostly Jewish gangsters in Detroit, mostly associated with Al Capone. Moran's gang waited patiently at the garages for the load to arrive. Eventually, they saw vehicles approach. Men got out of the vehicles and headed towards them. But it was the police. It seemed as though someone had ratted on the deal. Moran's gang weren't too concerned. They could usually buy the cops' silence with a bribe or two. Except they couldn't with these cops. Because they weren't actually cops. Four men come out and they walk inside. Two of them are dressed as police officers. The fake officers are carrying weapons. They're carrying shotguns. They go into the garage from the back. And that is where they find members of the Moran gang and their collaborators, all these seven men. They're messing around with two of the trucks that they brought in to uh, get the booze out of there. The police ordered Bugs' men to turn and face the wall. The gang realized this wasn't a raid. It was a hit. But it was too late. This is broad daylight. This was not in some secretive, you know, a farm field at midnight in the middle of nowhere. This is downtown Chicago, middle of the day, and ruthless assassination in a very clever way, by the way. The four assassins pretended to be policemen, had the gangsters line up against the wall pretending to, you know, frisk them, and then the next thing they knew, they were machine gunned to death. Um, to give the appearance that everything was under control, the two police officers walk out the two accomplices in street clothes with their hands up. So it looks like they've arrested someone, even though they have not. As the fake police officers leave the scene, Moran's men were dead on the floor. Moran somehow had escaped assassination, but his gang would never be the same. Um, the North Side gang really was, in the end, kneecapped from the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. They were around into the 30s, but their glory days were gone. Al Capone is arguably the only gangster at the time who could murder seven of his opponents in broad daylight in one of the most audacious hits at that time in gangster history. Bugs Morin, who was supposed to be the target of the hits, actually didn't get assassinated. And he famously told reporters, nobody murders like that except Al Capone. And meaning that other gangsters were maybe equally as vicious. Other gangsters might have thought of putting a plan like that into effect. But Capone is the one who actually did it. And again, this is broad daylight. This was not in some secretive, you know, a farm field at midnight in the middle of nowhere. This is downtown Chicago, middle of the day and ruthless assassination in a very clever way, by the way. I've been hearing a lot of great things about CBD. It's produced from the hemp plant. It's non-psychoactive, legal in all 50 states. And millions of Americans are already using CBD to help with pain, anxiety, and sleep. If you're looking to try CBD, you need to go to mdrncbd.com, pronounced moderncbd.com. It's a one-stop shop for everything CBD. Modern CBD curates the best CBD products from only the most reputable brands. They sell their own line of high-quality hemp-derived CBD products. Plus, they offer other top-selling CBD brands that use USA-grown hemp. So convenient. Modern CBD has so many great products on their site, 
like gummies, soft gels, oils, even pet products, to help with their anxiety or arthritis. And all of modern CBD's products have passed strict quality control procedures. Modern CBD really is the leading site to buy CBD online. And right now, I have a special offer for you that's too good to pass up. Get 30% off your order, plus free shipping, but only when you use my code, MAFIA. Do this today. Go to ModernCBD.com. That's M-D-R-N-C-B-D.com. And use my code MAFIA to get 30% off, plus free shipping. That's MDRNCBD.com. Code MAFIA. Photographs of the shocking scene spread across the nation. It was a scene of violence that had not been matched, even in Chicago. But Capone had the perfect alibi. As the massacre was going on, he had made sure he was the company of an attorney, a watertight alibi for a mobster. The beer wars were over, and he had won. If, if Moran is dead, Capone realizes he's won, that he has sole control of the uh, rackets in Chicago, and he's the top dog there, and it means that he's immensely wealthy. Um, his income, it's hard to estimate what his income really was, but it was a huge. It was immense. If it were in today's dollars, he would be a billionaire. Um, and this, this meant that he was finally the top dog. Though Capone's archenemy was still alive, he would no longer be a thorn in Capone's side. But Capone is about to discover that his botched Valentine's Day massacre would add other powerful names to his list of enemies. In the next episode, Capone's love of attention finally landed him in trouble with a new kind of police force that aren't taking bribes. Yes, Capone controlled the new controlled the Chicago Police Department and a lot of the politicians, but he didn't control Washington or the federal agencies. And Hoover simply unleashed everything that he could, including the IRS orders. Even the fellow gangsters were starting to get nervous about the scrutiny he put himself under. The other bosses were afraid that Capone's fate might become theirs, that they would also be jailed, and that gave them even more impetus to re remain secretive. And the law finally caught up with him, but not for violent murders or even for bootlegging, but for a new loophole the FBI could exploit. They were going to show that he didn't pay his taxes. Uh, now, that was tough to do because Capone didn't file tax returns, and they didn't know how much money he earned. This has been an Audio Boom and World Media Rights co-production, hosted by me, Fleet Cooper. It is produced by Audio Boom's Ben Hosley, Rachel Jacobs, Casey Georgie, and Karen Bevan, and by Pascal Hughes for World Media Rights. We had additional production help from World Media Rights by Gerald Zibingua and James Tyndale. David McNabb is the series' creative director, and the executive producers for Audio Boom are Brendan Regan and Stuart Last. Thanks to Manscaped, Lightstream, and HelloFresh for sponsoring this episode. Follow Mafia on Spotify, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows. <laughs>